I wonder what your reaction was when you first saw this script or when Ryan first pitched it to you? Um, yeah, I mean, he pitched it to me as a, 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 a series about that moment in American history when people of color and women had been such a big part of the war effort and were given all of this opportunity. Um, yeah. And uh, as soon as the war was won and the GIs came home, it was kind of like, thanks so much, you all can go sit down now. And um, we see so many women in, the, in our story who have such ambitions for their, their, themselves and their careers, um, but are struggling against the old patriarchal mores um, that have you know, returned, to, returned to roost. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I thought that was a really interesting moment to talk about, one that I really hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and I also thought that reclaiming the Mildred Ratched character in a kind of a feminist way uh, was a brilliant stroke because obviously it's uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is a great movie and she's a great character, but it's also a deeply misogynistic um, worldview. And like, yes. let's take a look at, at Mildred and who she is and where she came from. And is she a really a monster? And Mm -hmm. Are monsters born or are monsters created? And what, what went into creating her? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, you touched on so many things right there. Uh, one thing I, I want to be sure to say off the bat is um, one of the things that Ryan Murphy's been doing, he did it with Hollywood as well, is handing back narratives to marginalized people, including okay. queer people. And this film, or I'm sorry, project to me, I think it's his most lesbian project that I've ever seen. And it continually subverts the tropes that befell queer women in old Hollywood or queer people, but you know, especially women. Uh, I was, I kept waiting for tragedy uh, and I was kind of delighted. Uh, and I wonder if you would talk about the importance of handing back narratives to people of color, to women, to queer people and um, how Hollywood kind of dictated um, the way we see ourselves. Yes, so when I watched the series with my, my wife and I watched it with our 17 year old son and he said, it's so weird. It's like this film noir, but it's not black and white. It's not full of shadows. It's like in bright saturated technicolor. Yeah. Uh, and he said, and it's, so it's this weird disjunct, but he said, actually, it makes it even creepier that the <laughs> colors are so cheerful. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think really about this moment in American history that we think of as our apex and our, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of optimism and prosperity and opportunity, but how many people in the United States for whom that was not true. And even people who looked like it was true, how, incredibly constricted they were. Um, mm -hmm. And that in this, in this bright, shiny, colorful surface, how much malevolence is, is right underneath the surface. Yeah. Um, and I think in, in, in centering it around a mental hospital and trying to decide not only to, to treat mental, how to treat mental illness, but actually what is what is mental illness and what constitutes a mental illness? We certainly see a whole host of people, including queer people, who yeah. are defined as mentally ill and are subjected to sadistic tortures and lobotomies as a as a curative mm -hmm. means. And I think one of the big themes of Ratchet is um, if there is some part of you that either you don't like or society doesn't like trying to cut it out of yourself or suppress it is not going to in any way eradicate it from you. It is actually going to only, pushing it down is only going to make it spring back bigger and stronger than before. And the only way to actually deal with parts of yourself that you might not be uh, happy with or somebody might not be happy with is to own them and accept them and bring them out of the shadows into the light of day and really look at them. And so 
the character that I play, Gwendolyn, so different from the characters that I usually play. I usually play people who are far more, um, you know, divided a- upon themselves and mm-hmm. uh, far uh, darker and quirkier. Um, and Gwendolyn is so purely who she is. And yeah. so, so in complete, you know, some some people have asked me about she's struggling with her sexuality. It's like, she's not struggling at all. <laughs> she understands exactly who she is and what she yeah. wants. And she's trying to make it happen in 1947, which is very difficult. But she is the only right. person in Ratchet sort of advocating the, the path of light. Well, she has no pathos. I really love that about her because, you know, if you look at films with queer coded characters at that time, they were all, you know, self-hating miserable. so miserable yeah yes. yeah so so wonderful and um, i i don't have too much time it's going kind of fast i have to be sure that i ask you about working with these this amazing cast of women uh, so closely with sarah paulson obviously and then every line judy davis delivers oh, is- i know <laughs> The scene where they fight over the peach, I was howling on my couch. It's There is no better actress in the world than Judy Davis. And to, to watch her up close is just amazing. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and Sarah is so incredible. And like, they're, they're, this character has so many different colors. And I also, in light of what you said at the beginning about it's his most lesbianic project, I really mm-hmm. think, I don't think there should be any litmus test for who gets to play what kind of parts, but I think having two queer women playing these two queer characters was an enormous boon. And I, there was a whole bunch of different things that happened, particularly later in the series where Sarah and I, you know, went in and spoke to the writers and said, this can't happen. Can't we have more of this? Why does this have to happen that way? And they were amazing and they, and they, and they listened. And in, in line of what you were saying before, you know, um, I, they were originally going to have my character uh, die at the end of season one, and she doesn't. So I think that's a that's a boon in and of itself. I'm sure there's lots of heartbreak and pathos, you know, around the corner, but but um, for now, but for now, yeah. I have to wrap up. I do just want to say because uh, I had a question, but if you were going to be in a lavender marriage with anyone who better than Michael Benjamin <laughs> Washington. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I said, you know, it was, it was, uh, I said to him, I love that you're playing my husband. Aren't we straining credulity a bit that this would be happening? And I, when Ryan first told me, I was like, wasn't that illegal? And he was like, not in California. Um, and when I talked to Michael Benjamin Washington about it, he said, actually, there was a whole group of like, the African-American leaders, the NAACP, so many of them had white wives and it was a kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, coding, you know, kind of a Mm. signal coding of like, hi, I'm here, I'm for integration, but don't worry, I don't hate white people, look at my wife, like, let's move forward, so. That's fascinating, I didn't know that, so thank you for that. Yeah. I, I do have to wrap, but thank you so much. Uh, this has been an honor. I appreciate it. A pleasure. Pleasure for me too. Thank Bye. you. Take care.